by Ostitutes selling dodgy data to the highest bidder. Scientific frauds fudging figures to publish before they perish. Statistical charlatans p-hacking significant results in the confidence that no one will be checking their work. Last time on The Corbett Report, we examined the crisis of science, or more precisely, the crises of science. The replication crisis, the crisis of fraud, the crisis of publication, and the crisis of peer review. We also explored the shared root of these problems in the rise of big science, where large-scale capital investments are increasingly a requirement for cutting-edge research. Today, the solitary inventor tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. Big science requires big money either from big corporations or big government. But as we've already seen, when big corporations are funding the research, the science is invariably skewed in the interests of the company who is paying for it. And when big government is funding the research, the science is invariably skewed by political interests, lobbyists, and military contractors. Even worse, we sometimes get the admixture of the two, combining Eisenhower's twin nightmare of a military-industrial complex with the scientific technological elite. This is the problem facing humanity at the crossroads of the 21st century, on the cusp of innovations in robotics, computing, genomics, and other breakthrough sciences that have the potential to transform our world forever, for better or for worse. In the face of such monumental challenges, it's easy to throw our hands up and watch as the old guard of the scientific establishment circles the wagons and goes back to business as usual. But there are real solutions to these problems, and we all, scientists and non-scientists alike, have a part to play in implementing them. Today, let's explore solutions, open science. This is The Corbett Report. Ever since the publication of John Ioannidi's groundbreaking 2005 paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False?, the scientific community has been engaged in a debate about what this crisis of science signifies, what kinds of measures are needed to fix it, and even whether there is really a crisis at all. But as the data continues to pour in from every field of study, the results are by now unquestionable. The scientific institutions that exist today are producing extremely untrustworthy results. Is there actually a reproducibility crisis? And nature went as far as to say, let's ask people and see if they agree uh, that there is a crisis. Uh, and so they surveyed 1,500 researchers, and 90% of them agreed that there is a significant crisis, or I, I don't know what a slight crisis is, but a slight uh, <laughs> crisis. In industry, CEOs and leaders in the field of, in biotech and, and pharma are coming out and saying, well, we, we've known this for a long time. We already know that, you know, and probably 50% of the studies published in top tier academic journals can't be repeated. We know it, we can't repeat it in our labs. This should be unnerving because we depend on science to fly in those planes to get to that antibiotic that you need when you get sick and have an infection when you land in the emergency room. This is a big deal. They could replicate only six of the 53 landmark studies for oncology drug target projects. And the conclusion was that the failure to win the war on cancer has been blamed on many factors, but recently 
a new culprit has emerged, too many basic scientific discoveries are just wrong. And we just need to do the whole job from scratch as if these papers did not even exist. This is very worrisome. Hedge funds don't trust science any longer. So this is from a, a business journal. They claim that at least 50% of published studies, even those in top tier academic journals, cannot be repeated with the same conclusions by an industrial lab. And the potential for not being able to reproduce academic data is a disincentive to early stage investors. At least one firm now is hiring CROs to independently validate academic science prior to putting up serious money. What this means is that these companies or these hedge funds, they, they say that the scientific literature, it's just for the scientists. It's, it's not serious. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's more of a toy. And uh, if you really want to be serious and not waste your money, you'd better try to do it from scratch and make sure that it works. Otherwise, you're running a very large risk. It is getting harder for researchers to deny that there is a problem. But as with any such crisis, if the problem is defined narrowly enough, then the solution to that problem can be limited to a few cosmetic alterations of the existing system. If we take the crisis of science as merely a problem with shoddy statistical analysis, for example, then surely all that is needed is to put more time and effort into training scientists in the proper use of statistical tools. With an increased awareness of the problem of p-hacking or other statistical tricks, journal editors and reviewers could put extra time into scrutinizing the results of statistical analyses in research papers. Or if the crisis is simply a problem of fraud, then an awareness campaign about the problem could pressure researchers to publish their raw data for scrutiny by the wider scientific community. If the crisis is just a result of the publication pressures that modern academics are subjected to, then the creation of alternative journals that publish negative results or inconclusive findings could provide an outlet for researchers to earn publication credit while being forthcoming with their failures. Indeed, all of these problems, and many more, have been identified, and all sorts of solutions have been proposed or even implemented to help remedy them. There are growing calls to raise the threshold for statistical significance, issuing guidelines for the use of p-values in research, or even outright banning the use of p-values in papers, as the journal Basic and Applied Social Psychology did in 2015. There are calls for more publications to require scientists to publish raw data, methodology, and other relevant information along with their research so that their experiments can be more reliably replicated. A number of journals dedicated to publishing negative and null results have been created in recent years, and in 2017, the Journal of Negative Results in Biomedicine ceased publication after declaring that it had succeeded in its mission of convincing other mainstream journals to publish more articles reporting negative or null results. Sites like Retraction Watch keep an eye on the fraud, abuse, mistakes, and misdeeds of scientists, publishers, and institutions around the world, drawing attention to scandals and problems in the system rather than trying to sweep them under the rug. All of these ideas, and many more, are important and necessary steps in fixing some of the problems that have come to plague modern institutional science. But they are not sufficient to solve the crisis of science. Because, as even the leaders of this movement to reimagine science will readily admit, this crisis is not about p-values or publishers or practices. It is about the nature of the scientific community itself. Who should take responsibility for the replication culture? Well, I think that one option is if you have the whole field coalescing, which is what's happening in genetics, it could be the same investigators. If you have multiple investigators, each one of them kind of cross-checking each other, they can have multiple analytical teams look at the same data. Um, hopefully, that would be pretty objective. Someone might fear that this might be too much inbred. Um, so you need different investigators. And if you want different investigators, then who is that going to be? If you have an all-inclusive consortium approach, it's difficult to find such people. Maybe you can find some who still belong to the same school, and therefore you don't have real independence in the replication process. One option is to try to see if there's uh, investigators of competing theories and hypotheses, if they can be convinced, if they can look at the data, well, provided the data, the methods, the software, the script is available, 
if they can also repeat a study according to what they think is the best way to do it, and they get the same results, I think this is very, very strong evidence. Um, but that model may not necessarily always be available. You can have also combinations of the above, or you can open the process to the wide public. Now, the wide public could also be the wild public. Now, lots of senior investigators will start saying, uh, I'm a senior scientist. I have trained for 500 years to become so experienced. And how can I have someone who's clueless, who has never tried his hands on the field, look at my research? Um, we need to be careful, uh, but, but we also need to be open. And there's many research questions that indeed involving the wide public in some sort of citizen scientist model might be the way to go and to compare notes on what we get. The idea that science should be open to the wide public, even to the wild public, is one that produces a great deal of consternation among the defenders of the scientific status quo. What role do the unwashed masses have to play in the hallowed halls of the modern Church of Science? Aren't these spaces reserved for the white-robed priests of this secular religion? Thankfully, as more and more innovators step up to the plate to provide ideas for the wider public to access scientific knowledge and play an increasingly important role in developing, sharing, and using that knowledge, the ideas of citizen science and open science are no longer something to be laughed at. At the root of this revolutionary approach to the scientific process is the understanding that access to scientific knowledge is the key to enabling meaningful public participation. In the wake of the open everything ethos that the internet has helped to foster, it may be difficult to remember, but the debate over whether or not scientific data and discovery should be locked away behind paywalls and kept within the cloistered confines of academia was one that was raging just a few short years ago and it was a debate that cost at least one activist his life. Well, today we have news for you about Aaron Schwartz. He's the executive director of Demand Progress, a co-founder of Reddit, and he's been a frequent guest on this show. But yesterday, he was arrested and charged with violating federal hacking laws for downloading four million docu documents from JSTOR from MIT's network. Now, if convicted of the felony charges, Schwartz could face up to 35 years in prison and a $1 million fine. Now, JSTOR is a company that provides digitized copies of academic journals. It's used in universities all over the country. And they've already come out saying that they did not refer this case to the feds and that all of the information has been returned. But the arrest has once again shown a light on the fight for open access to information. Aaron Swartz committed suicide on Friday. He hanged himself in his Brooklyn apartment. He was 26 years old. His death occurred just weeks before he was to go on trial for using computers at MIT, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to download millions of copyrighted academic articles from JSTOR, a subscription database of scholarly papers. JSTOR declined to press charges, but prosecutors moved the case forward. Aaron Swartz faced up to 35 years in prison and million dollars in fines for allegedly violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. When the case first came to light, the United States attorney for the District of Massachusetts, Carmen Ortiz, said, quote, stealing is stealing, whether you use a computer command or a crowbar and whether you take documents, data or dollars. In 2008, Internet pioneer and cyber visionary Aaron Swartz penned the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto, laying out the basis for the open access movement. Information is power, but like all power, there are those who want to keep it for themselves. The world's entire scientific and cultural heritage, published over centuries in books and journals, is increasingly being digitized and locked up by a handful of private corporations. Want to read the papers featuring the most famous results of the sciences? You'll need to send enormous amounts to publishers like Reed Elsevier. There are those struggling to change this. The open access movement has fought valiantly to ensure that scientists do not sign their copyrights away, but instead ensure their work is published on the internet under terms that allow anyone to access it. The document ended with a call to action. We need to take information, wherever it is stored, make our copies and share them with the world. We need to take stuff that's out of copyright and add it to the archive. We need to buy secret databases and put them on the web. We need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks. 
we need to fight for guerrilla open access. As we now know, this document, innocuous as it may seem, led to tragedy as Swartz's own attempt to liberate the information from JSTOR, a digital library of academic journals, led to his arrest and, ultimately, his death. But the open access movement did not die with Aaron Swartz. Today, an increasing number of researchers are committed to publishing in open access journals and in online spaces, like the Public Library of Science website, that are freely available to the public. But the idea of open access is not about knowledge for its own sake. It is about the radical potential of such a movement to open the doors of academia's ivory towers and to encourage a greater role for the public in the scientific process. Open access is just the first domino in a series of ideas that lead to a radically different view of science and its place in society. The first level of public participation in the scientific process itself involves a citizen-scientist model that is drawing increasing attention from the wider scientific community. In this model, interested amateurs help scientists to collect, store, process, and even analyze data as part of a wider research project. The modern manifestation of this idea takes its cue from the life sciences, where outdoor enthusiasts have been called upon to help projects like the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, tracking the range and size of local butterfly populations, and the North American Bird Phenology Program, keeping tabs on the location and migration patterns of various bird populations. With the advent of personal computing and the internet, these initiatives were extended to even more arcane fields of scientific research. Pioneered by projects like SETI at Home, which used the spare computing resources of volunteers on the internet to analyze radio signals for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence, citizen science portals such as Zooniverse have been created to allow non-specialists to participate in a wide array of research projects across nearly every conceivable discipline. But this model of citizen science, heavily promoted on the TED Talk circuit and in the mainstream scientific press, does not question the fundamental divide between scientists and the wider public. In these cases, volunteers are merely being used to collect data or to dedicate their spare computing power to analyzing data as part of a larger project directed by a team of scientists. More radical still are ways that people are coming together to collaborate on solving problems themselves. In these projects, participation in every step of the process is encouraged and ideas are debated and discussed openly as a self-formed group discovers the answer to a question they themselves have asked. So my talk today is about uh, open science, which sits in roughly the same uh, relationship to science, basic scientific research, mostly academic research I'll be talking about, as open source software does uh, to the commercial software world. And so I want to, what I want to explore is the extent to which open source principles or style principles can be applied to the practice um, of basic scientific research. So I'm going to start off with an example uh, where this has been done successfully. So the example starts uh, with this man, uh, Timothy Gowers. Gowers is a mathematician. He's actually one of the world's leading mathematicians. Uh, he's, amongst other things, the recipient of the Fields Medal, which is often called the Nobel Prize, compared to the Nobel Prize in mathematics. Uh, Gowers, in addition to being a Nobel a Fields Medal winning mathematician, uh, is also a blogger. Uh, this is not that uncommon, actually, amongst leading mathematicians. Of the 42 Living Fields medalists, uh, four of them, in fact, have started uh, blogs. So that's about one in 10, which I don't know how that compares to the general population, but, it, but it's pretty good. Uh, anyway, in January of 2009, Gowers wrote this very interesting post with the title, Is Massively Collaborative Mathematics Possible? And what he was proposing to do in this post was to use his blog as a medium to attack a difficult, unsolved mathematical problem, a problem which he said he would love to solve, completely in the open, using his blog as a way of past, posting his uh, partial progress and his ideas. And what's more, he issued an open invitation inviting anybody in the world who thought that they had an idea to contribute to post that idea in the comments section of the blog. So he called this experiment the Polymath Project. Well, the Polymath Project got off to actually quite a slow start. Excuse me. Uh, in the first seven hours after he opened his blog up for comments, not a single person wrote in with any suggestions. But then a mathematician at the University of British Columbia named Joseph Solomosi 
posted a suggestion. Basically, it's a variation, a simplified variation of the original problem which he was suggesting. Might be a bit easier to attack. And then 15 minutes after that, a high school teacher, in fact, from Arizona, named Jason Dyer, wrote a short suggestion. And just three minutes after that, Terence Tao, also actually a Fields medalist, he's a mathematician at UCLA, uh, posted a suggestion. And so things were really off and running at this point. Over the next 37 days, in fact, 27 different people would post 800 substantive mathematical comments containing 170,000 words. That's a lot of mathematics done very quickly. It was hard, actually, I, I was following along. I didn't contribute substantively, um, but I was following along quite closely. And it was difficult simply to find the time just to read uh, all the contributions. It was really going remarkably quickly. You'd see people, you know, they'd propose an idea in a very half-baked form, and then often it would be very rapidly developed, sometimes by other people. Um, sometimes, of course, it would be discarded, but other times it would then be incorporated into the, the canon of knowledge. Gowers described this process as being to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. And at the end of the 37 days, he used his blog to announce that the problem had most probably uh, been solved. In fact, a, a slight a generalization of the original problem which they were attacking. Uh, they still had to go back and check that they hadn't made any silly mistakes. In fact, everything did indeed uh, check out ultimately. Uh, and they wrote two papers based on it. It took months more to do all the cleanup work. But the, the back of the problem had in fact been solved at this point. Now, of course, the reason I'm talking about this polymath project is not really so much because of the particular mathematical problem. You know, it's not important because it solved a particular mathematical problem. It's, it's rather important because of what it suggests. It suggests that we can use uh, some of these sorts of tools as kind of cognitive tools to potentially speed up the solution, not of simple, everyday problems, but actually of problems which challenge some of the smartest people in the world. You know, that, that's really exciting. These are problems right at the limit of human intellectual ability, and not just you know, one particular problem, but perhaps broadly across many different fields. The implications of this type of spontaneous collaborative problem solving extend far beyond the field of mathematics. In a world that is increasingly being transformed by scientific pursuits, and where the cost of mistakes are correspondingly high, a public that is skeptical about scientific institutions, government regulators, and other supposed authorities is increasingly taking responsibility for scientific fact-checking into their own hands. One stark demonstration of this fact came in the wake of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdowns in March 2011. As we now know, Japanese officials withheld data from the government's own Speedy Network, a computer system that had been set up specifically to provide forecasts of nuclear radiation fallout in the event of an emergency. When the data was finally released months later, it was revealed that local officials, having been kept in the dark by government scientists, had evacuated residents directly into the path of the fallout. The situation left residents and concerned citizens around the globe scrambling for accurate, up-to-date information about radiation readings, and distrustful of the government agencies who were interested in keeping that information from the public. The response was a spontaneous, volunteer-organized citizen science project called SafeCast that designed a radiation measuring device that would be able to take radiation readings of an area every five seconds and upload that data to an open-source database. The product of this remarkable initiative has been the creation of the largest database of its kind in the world, one that has been independently verified as accurate. And it was started and continues to operate as an independent, decentralized, global volunteer project of concerned citizens, scientists and non-scientists alike. And then, March 2011, in Fukushima, this earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown, like triple thing happened. And everybody uh, was very confused. We didn't know what was going on. And, you know, I had these connections in Tokyo, so I was reaching out to try to find out what was going on. Uh, other people were, were scrambling around, and nobody really knew what was happening. And the little bit of information that was starting to come out really made no sense. People would see, you know, there, a map like this would be published, and they're like, well, what does this even mean? I don't even know. Nobody knew. And so uh, I started talking to Joey again, and Joey introduced me to his friend Peter, who lived in Tokyo and had lived in Tokyo for like 35 years and had family who was in uh, one of the areas that got really uh, severely impacted by the tsunami. 
And so we just started talking about, you know, how can we get some information together? Because, you know, there's no information available for people. Nobody knows what's happening. And so we thought, okay, let's reach out to everybody we know. We, we got to find somebody who knows something about this, uh, who different pieces, and we can pull them together and, and you know, continue this conversation somehow. So we all reached out to whoever we might know that might have some connection. And so for me, that looked like my, my hacker friends at, at the crash base in Los Angeles and at Tokyo Hackerspace, my friend Matt Alt, who I had done the toy website with, who's now living in Tokyo, and he helped translate uh, a lot of the Japanese stuff that was coming out from the official news sources on stuff. Bunny, uh, who I knew from hacker conferences and who jumped in and started helping us build hardware. Um, Hayan, who was a designer that I knew from IDEO, and she was creating visualizations with the data we were putting together. And Paul from who I knew from the Metro blog in Dublin, who jumped in and started help, helping us write the back-end software to manage it all. And Joey and Peter had the same sort of thing. They found all these people and pulled them together. And so we, we all got together and, and created this thing that ended up being this organization called SafeCast. And at first, uh, we just duct taped some Geiger counters to car windows and started driving around and trying to get an idea of what was happening and realized that uh, those measurements were changing much faster and uh, it was a little bit of a different story than kind of these big uh, averages that were being published um, by, by anything official. So we created a hardware and software platform, and um, these little devices that had GPS on them and Geiger counters, and they take readings every five minutes or every five seconds, and, uh, and then upload it into this giant data set, right? And you could attach them to cars or bikes or anything, and we could take them around. And so we started putting these maps together, and, and these circles are the evacuation zones, right? So we started seeing this story um, where inside of the evacuation zones, maybe the levels weren't necessarily that bad, but outside of the evacuation zones, they were, they were much worse. And this, this was kind of uh, you know, conflicting because there were most certainly situations where people had been moved from areas with low radiation into areas with high radiation, and we didn't quite get where it was going on. Um, so seven years on, this is, this is what our data looks like in that area. We really like, mapped out like, every street and, and created this absolutely perfect picture of uh, what's happening. But an important piece of this is that uh, we're not going and measuring. Rather, we created the tools and the platform so that the people there can measure on their own, right? So the, these areas are being measured by the people who live there and are impacted by it. And this really gave them uh, you know, a chance to have a say in, in what was going on with it, right? They got to measure stuff. They weren't getting answers from other places. But it also had some very interesting real-world impacts in that it forced the officials to do something. They actually changed the evacuation zones after we published this data showing that these things were different, right? And we expanded this out, and this is the data we have for, uh, for Japan. It, it's basically... Uh, every single street in Japan we've measured time and time and time again, but it turns out that um, the data that wasn't available in Japan also wasn't available anywhere else in the world. Uh, nobody had this kind of stuff. So we started uh, you know, reaching out to other people and people in other places started measuring. So this is what we have in Europe and this is what we have in the US. And you can see these are, you know, somebody attached a sensor to a car and went on a drive down a road, right? This is what we have around the world. And obviously there's some uh, major holes that we still need to help fill in, but it's getting there and it's um, already the largest data set that's ever existed um, of its kind in any way. Uh, almost 100 million data points, and we put all of the data into the public domain. And um, it's actually g growing faster, like all the time. It's not slowing down in any way. So if you remember I said that, you know, uh, maybe some people will kind of participate once something gets going. Uh, I learned through this that sometimes some is all you need. Um, you don't need everybody to do it. You just need some people who are going to be active with it, right? And with SafeCast, I tried to build in these, these things that, that I noticed in all of these other things, right? Um, where the people are independent on their own. Like, you know, we gave them the tools, we gave them the best practices, but they're doing the thing on their own without any, uh, you know, hindrance or control from, from outside on this. Um, there's lots of different ways for people to help with the project. Some people are making visualizations, some people are collecting data, some people are building devices. All of these different things people can do with it, right? Um, and then again, it removes the reliance on some outside authority for the people in, in the areas that are measuring it. But it's not just about um, disaster and stuff, right? So this is Peter, who I mentioned before. And a few years ago, we went to Washington, D.C. to put on a workshop about SafeCast and what we're doing with this. And so if you wanted to see the publicly available radiation data for Washington, D.C., 
uh, the day before our event, it would have looked like this. There was absolutely nothing, nothing available. So we had this two-day event where people came in and they built their own sensors, uh, found out how they worked, understood it, got their sensors up and running, and then we sent them out, walk around Washington, D.C., and just measure stuff, and then come back and we'll, we'll put everything together. And so this was the data that was available just after one day of people walking around. We mapped out the whole city and found some interesting stuff. There's like the World War II memorial over here that uh, is built with very radioactive granite and, you know, all of these kind of things that you, you might not have known otherwise. And, uh, and that was really cool for people, but a much more interesting thing happened shortly thereafter in that the, um, the U.S. government released their data set of radiation in, in Washington, D.C., right? So they had this data, um, but since they were the only people that had the data, they kept it secret. And then as soon as there was another comprehensive data set available, there was no reason for them to keep it secret anymore, and so they released it. And so it's this kind of thing where, uh, you know, releasing this open data actually creates even more public data than, than we had our hands in at all, which is uh, where people start throwing around these kind of, like, words like revolution, which is cool. But the result of that is that, you know, this does, in fact, change the world in, in all of these ways. And so um, I've been talking a lot about uh, radiation, but last year we actually started measuring air quality as well because, you know, that's another thing that maybe if we're putting sensors around it might be really useful to people. And so this is uh, where we just put a bunch of them around Los Angeles last year. Um, and on the on the system right now, you can see what's happening right now, or you know, five minutes ago, or the, you know, historical over the last week or or the last month, and start see, start seeing these trends and where all this. Uh, you know, you start comparing the data from the different sensors and start kind of understanding what it is that people are breathing in the city. And so to tie this back into the sort of citizen science idea, right, I don't really like, um, like, separating this out somehow, like, somehow citizen science is different than, like, you know, real science or something. Because, like, if it's valid science, it's valid science. It doesn't matter who's doing it as long as the results um, stand up. In some ways, SafeCast is the fulfillment of the vision that Aaron Swartz laid out in the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto. Open access, open source data, extended peer review, and other such proposals for reforming the practice of science do not offer the public the chance to peek behind the curtain at the doings of the scientists. They help tear down that curtain, and the distinction between scientists and the wider public generally. But the story of SafeCast also provides a key insight into why citizen science is needed now more than ever. From nuclear energy, to genetically modified foods, to vaccines, to gene editing, to nanotechnology, to autonomous weapons, the debate over scientific knowledge and discoveries is increasingly important, and political. The pace of science in the 21st century is dizzying, and as the abilities of science to transform our world accelerates, the debate over the proper place for these technologies in society is increasingly being handed over to the scientists themselves. But this has the process exactly backwards. As philosophers of science like Andrea Saltelli and the co-authors of Science on the Verge point out, our naive conception of scientists as apolitical arbiters of truth is going to have to be adjusted to the reality of modern-day science before the entire process of scientific knowledge production is undermined. In this day and age, science has become specialized on uh, models and statistics in a way that I think in the popular conception of folk science is not the central pursuit of ultimate truth. Uh, in what could be termed folk science or the Cartesian dream are a couple of terms that are used in Science on the Verge. Uh, people tend to think of science in a certain mindset, um, but obviously that doesn't apply to the way that science is conducted these days. What can you tell us about that difference between popular conception of science and the way it is actually practiced in modern policy settings? Um, for me, this is uh, a core problem of, of, of modernity. Uh, there is really a hiatus between how science is perceived uh, in, by the general public and by the scientists themselves for a large majority, a kind of uh, positivistic uh, vision of science has the offspring of the Enlightenment, which is concerned with the production of uh, facts separate from values and emotion and, and uh, science as objective and so on and so forth. Um, 
enhance the science capable of informing policy with the production of uh, disinterested uh, and objective knowledge and the reality of uh, what science is and you know, the many use to which science is put from the construction of algorithms to uh, artificial intelligence to the production of various kinds of chemicals which may or may not be extremely dangerous, opioids and neonicotinoids for pesticide, and then uh, the chapter of military technology and, and so on and so forth. So we have a uh, we have a science today in the practice of the working scientists, which is quite far from the vision of the uh, an enlightenment science. And I think this this difference this um, um, is a problem in the sense that we should resolve it. Otherwise, we risk having uh, a very polarized discussion about science, which can only have as a result uh, a collapse of trust in science. And of course, that is part and parcel of that crisis of science that I was gesturing towards recently on the podcast. And I did note a specific line jumped out at me from the preface of uh, Science on the Verge, which was written by Daniel Sarowitz. He wrote, uh, the use of science in guiding human affairs is always a political act. Now, that's a bold statement, um, because, again, I think that rubs up against the conception, the sort of folk science conception that science is completely value neutral and we're just looking at facts and evidence about the world. But the use of science in guiding human affairs is always a political act. What does that mean in the modern context where we're dealing with such incredibly important matters that have policy implications for everyone around the globe? Well, it's a, it's a long, it's a long chain of of uh, of uh, consideration which should be put down there. The first one is even when we are talking about a simple piece of datum, um, as Jerry Rabbits writes in one of his uh, early books, before a single datum is collected, a lot of uh, the work has already been done by way of framing the problem, defining what is uh, that needs to be tackled and how it can be measured and so on and so forth. So when the social scientists say that data or evidence is a result of a social construction, this doesn't mean that this is uh, um, arbitrary. Is simply what it means. It's the result of a negotiation and social construction. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, there is... Uh, uh, there is, uh, because of this positivism or neopositivism, uh, very often found in natural sciences, and, uh, and this tendency to regard this as a dangerous intrusion of social sciences into natural sciences, uh, so that, uh, uh, for instance, typically, you may, you may know natural scientists uh, strongly resent being the subject of study from the social sciences uh, when they go there as anthropologists and measure what science in action actually does. Uh, following the title of the famous book of Bruno Latour. So there is uh, this kind of um, science war no? always uh, uh, boiling in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the underground, which uh, makes this, co this conversation a, a bit difficult because if, if it were not for that, the idea that science... Uh, uh, evident, the production of evidence for policy is a political affair would be a no-brainer, of course, because not only you have the datum, but then the datum becomes evident, and then the evidence must be constructed as an argument. And this is not something which a policymaker does by himself. He does it with a scientist. So obviously, it's a high political affair. If science is always a political act, then drawing a line around scientific activity and preserving it as the special domain of an elite cadre of specialists is itself an act of disenfranchisement. By pushing the public away from the scientific field, those with a political or corporate agenda to push can use their money to subvert the scientific process behind the scenes and hide behind the ivory tower walls when the public questions the pronouncements of the scientists. This is why open access, open data, open science is so feared by the status quo establishment, which benefits from the symbiotic relationship between big business, big government, and big science. None of this is to say that the expertise of trained scientists will no longer be needed as radically decentralized scientific endeavors like SafeCast rise to the fore. But it is a sign that the public no longer has to sit on its hands and watch helplessly as an unquestioned and unquestionable priest class towards their data and their findings for the benefit of the corporations and governments who foot their bill. Given the immensity of the challenges we face as humanity pushes the boundaries of the possible in ever bolder ways, it's easy for those on the sidelines to throw their hands up and leave this all for the scientists to sort out. Or, 
worse yet, to turn their backs on science and the scientific method altogether. But these problems are bigger than the scientific community, and their solution will involve all of us to engage in the process of redefining science and its place in society. We either become part of the solution by engaging in the emergence of the open scientific community, or we become mere spectators as the big questions are increasingly asked and answered for us. Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The Club of Rome hypes Apocalypse 2040. We got that story plus the latest oily moves on the grand chessboard. But first, while we were off for the last couple of weeks for a little bit of summer break down here in the American Southwest, we went to a music festival called the Taos Vortex. Saw Flaming Lips, Thievery Corporation, Matthew Deere, and more. I've got the wacky T-shirt to prove it. Had a great time. Got home Sunday afternoon. This would be Sunday, August 5th. And saw the news that just as I was boogieing in the dance tent over the weekend, there was a very strange bust happening just a few miles away. I seem to have a knack for being near the weird in the media monarchy kingdom. We went from the Taos Vortex to the Taos Compound. New Mexico judge cries Islamophobia in decision to free jihadi compound suspects. That is a hefty headline. So let's break this story down. Reactions have ranged from shock to disbelief at a New Mexico judge's decision to free five suspects operating a heavily armed camp where prosecutors alleged 11 malnourished children were being trained for jihad while on the FBI's radar. Despite authorities finding the decomposing body of a three-year-old boy who was reportedly killed in a ritual ceremony by his father, the son of a famous imam who claimed his seizure-stricken child would resurrect his Jesus and use his psychic powers to help the group target corrupt institutions and people with violent actions. And despite a letter from one suspect to his brother inviting him to die as a martyr, New Mexico judge Sarah Bacchus on Monday released five alleged Muslim extremists on a $20,000 signature bond, meaning they don't have to pay it, while effectively admonishing the prosecution for Islamophobia. So this judge, Sarah Back, has actually survived kind of a recall petition to replace her back in 2016. And again, we're only five months down here in New Mexico. So I'm trying to sort of take the crash course on the strange geopolitics and the inner workings of New Mexico. But this really kind of takes the cake. New Mexico compound judge has a history of issuing low bail to violent offenders, and she's now gotten death threats, and they locked the Taos courthouse down yesterday, all of which, of course, plays perfectly into the MAGA versus Antifa summer LARP show, so that's like a bonus side mission accomplished. Some of the other stunning parts of this story, James, it's another massive headline. Man arrested at alleged child terrorist training compound in New Mexico is son of imam with possible link to 1993 World Trade Center bombing. The latest today, I saw authorities have already partially bulldozed the Taos compound, which strikes me as, you know, destroying the crime scene. And there's reports of sort of just leaving bullets and some weapons and some paperwork, including birth certificates left at the scene after the cops basically just kind of drove a bulldozer through it and, and wrecked the place. The other thing that I, I just do in the research just before we started to tape here, none of these guys have actually been released as of, as I'm talking to you right now, Wednesday, August 15th at 626 p.m. Mountain Time in Santa Fe, New Mexico. None of these guys have actually been out. There's now appeals and some battles back and forth. And James, the one thing I think I mostly want to know and am willing to put a fiver on it, how long have the feds actually known about this Taos compound? James? Well, we have some form of answer to that. Uh, I, I'll put in a link to, in the show notes to how the FBI dropped the ball on the case, talking about the development of this case and how the FBI came to know about it and all of the craziness surrounding it and the, the highly unusual procedures. Uh, it, this was They're squatting on land that is owned by a property owner who gave the FBI full permission to go and search the land. But so they didn't need a warrant of any kind or anything like that. But instead, they sent in some kind of undercover agent to try to get information about the compound first and all this. I mean, all this craziness um, and, and irregularity surrounding this. But it's interesting you bring up the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and the possible connection there. You know who else 
has a connection to the world. Not a possible or maybe or alleged connection, but a real, verifiable, provable connection to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing? Uh, Go it, for it. Very specifically, John Antisev of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Very specifically, yes. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, it, the FBI, of course. We know that they helped to instigate that plot. They helped with one of their, uh, their uh, informants to get that plot rolling, and then... They pulled him out, and uh, it went ahead with another guy, and uh, it went ahead. And the FBI, oops, oh dear, oh, this thing that we thought we had under control, didn't we didn't have under control. Oops, we dropped the ball, and here they are dropping the ball again. So uh, the only real question here is, why? Why is this being done? Why is this being set up in this way? Um, because clearly this is, again, they're breaking their own rules and, and jumping through hoops they don't need to jump through in order to do this it's almost as if they're setting it up for some kind of big for it to become this big story i mean it seems like this is this is a big honey trap for people hey guys look at this oh the you know the judge is on the muslim side oh the, it's the liberals it's antifa it's it's trump it's blah blah it feeds perfectly into the current state of affairs so it just it gets my mind wondering about some sort of uh you know, 21st century update version of PatCon that's no longer uh, focusing on the, the Patriot conspiracy, but now it's this Muslim versus Antifa versus Trump versus whatever they're, they're trying to stir up right now. That's where my mind goes with all of this. But actually, one of the things that first made me think this was a really weird story, I mean, the thing that really stuck out to me was that, uh, that tweet that you've got linked here with the, uh, where they bulldozed the compound and the reporters are walking through and there's still evidence, criminal evidence sitting there on the ground, birth certificates and stuff like this sitting there on the ground that they haven't even uh, touched yet. It's just total craziness. It reminds me of the 2015 San Bernardino thing where the, the press were given access to the, the home of the suspected shooters and they're trampling through the crime scene like that. Yeah, I mean, it just, it's, there's this reeks to high heaven. So the, clearly, clearly there are, setting up some sort of battle here well and i and i'll continue to watch it i've been covering it in at least in kind of small parts every morning on my morning show as again it's sort of really interesting story that fell just pretty much right here in my backyard that's how we get started here on new world next week episode 349 for august 16th 2018 our second story takes us from the local to the global iran bans talks with u.s after rollback of sanctions u.s threatened sanctions on europe the leader of iran ayatollah ali khamenei has banned holding any direct talks with the united states as tensions between the u.s and iran increases with the country testing a next generation short-range missile but don't worry it's not nuclear so it doesn't breach any accords this comes after an offer last month by america's next top president calling for talks with no preconditions with tehran iran has openly rejected that call for negotiation with its leader denouncing any talks with the u.s President Swamp Thing recently pulled out of the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran and last week reimposed sanctions against Iran. Economic sanctions, that is. Russia and Iran responded by what? Signing deals with other nations, three other ex-Soviet nations. In short, as activist Post writes, it's a cluster bleep. As a candidate, you might remember Trump, while not going so far as to like sing about bombing Iran to the tune of Beach Boys songs, essentially said he would have no problem going to war with Iran. Now, James, this is kind of a, a the smaller part of a story I think you can kind of extrapolate out as, of course, all the other nations kind of come, come into play on the grand chessboard here. Yes, and specifically one nation that I wrote about specifically uh, as this story was first developing was uh, China and its potential role in forming some sort of China-Iran axis or whatever, whatever it's going to be labeled in the media. And of course, there are, are signs of that developing um, right now. Uh, Oilprice.com just had up an article, Why China Will Continue to Buy Iranian Crude, talking about how the head of the international office of CPCIF, the China Petroleum and Chemical Industry Federation, Andre Yu, said that uh, Chinese companies need the Iranian oil in any circumstances and will continue to buy it. China doesn't pay attention to the U.S. sanctions on Iran. It is a routine between Iran and China and has nothing to do with the U.S. Oil, gas, and trade shouldn't be influenced by the U.S. anymore. Very bold talk that probably wouldn't have uh, floated very well or would have been just laughed off a decade or two ago, but in the changing climate. Well, now that suddenly has uh, a little bit of bite to that bark. And 
Uh, and it's interesting to also watch the EU and its own internal struggle with all of this because the EU companies, the EU is basically telling companies don't d ditch any deals because of US sanctions, but some companies are saying this is getting crazy, it's too difficult, we're going to ditch our deals. And so now they're going to have to get special authorization from the EU to stop working in Iran and things like this. So they're having this own their own internal struggle with this total craziness and chaos, which of course is part of the plan here. Um, but at, with always with the eye on the neocon prize, as always, of regime change of one form or another in Iran. That's ultimately the goal and has been for many, many, many years. And it hasn't eventuated yet, but they're continuing to hammer at it. And as I pointed out recently in my Good News This Week video, <laughs> sorry James, uh, I, uh, I did note that uh, recent polling shows that even after the incredible concerted propaganda campaign of recent months, still the ma vast majority of uh, the public are not on board with bombing Iran yet. So we'll have to wait for whatever provocateur, false flag, straight of war moves, dress our the U.S. boats up as Iranian PT boats move they make, whatever false flag they're planning. But at any rate, uh, for the moment, people aren't buying into the bomb, 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 bomb Iran hype. Well, and I think you'd be forgiven for thinking that the most important stories in the world don't don't have anything to do with this. If you watch just the political mainstream news here in the States, it's just – it's this like high school level. Did you have a secret tape recording of somebody saying bad words? It's just – it's it's a pretty sorry state of affairs. Again, it's, it's like a big giant reality TV show being headed up by a big – reality tv star meanwhile the real world also continues to turn uh, real world also being another reality show ha huh? see what i did there our final story on this new world next week episode of course what way to end an episode with, with the end of the world apocalypse 2040 shock as mit computer model predicts end date for civilization we grab this from express.co.uk an apocalyptic computer model processed by one of the world's largest computers in 1973, has predicted the end of civilization by 2040. The prediction came from a program nicknamed World One, One World, which was developed by a team of MIT researchers and processed by Australia's largest computer. It was originally devised by computer pioneer Jay Forrester. Why did he do it? Because the Club of Rome told him to do it. It's the same reason MIT is going crazy with the CRISPR chopping and editing, because DARPA is telling them to and funding them to. Sidebar. The shocking result of computer calculations showed that the level of pollution and population would cause global collapse by 2040. Australian broadcaster ABC has now republished its original report from the 1970s, which is some good kind of classic you know, black and white must-see TV, which is included on that page on Express. A fascinating forecast that shows the quality of life is expected to drop dramatically right after 2020. At this stage, around 2040 to 2050, civilized life as we know it on this planet will cease to exist. Alexander King, a British pioneer who led the Club of Rome, Express helpfully points out, also made a shocking prediction regarding national sovereignty. They just sort of bury this at the end of the article. He told ABC, sovereignty of nations is no longer absolute. There is a gradually diminishing of sovereignty, little bit by little bit, even in the big nations. This will happen. And the internet will be as useful as a fax machine. James, how many grains of salt should we take this latest expert prediction of gloom and doom with? All of them. <laughs> all of them. I uh, mean, first of all, look at the source, Club of Rome. And I hope I don't need to elaborate too much for my regular audience. But if I do, just type Club of Rome into my search engine and find some of the work I've done on the Club of Rome and their... There are various propaganda over the years, including the limits to growth, population hype nonsense from the 70s, um, the, the overpopulation scare, which was literally wrong about everything that they predicted. But hey, they had their big celebration, their 40-year, hey, look how great we were at predicting everything wrong celebration uh, a few years ago. And uh, they were also the ones behind the, uh, uh, what is the first global revolution or I can't remember the name off the top of my head but the ones where they said that climate change would fit the bill as a super convenient scare to make 
humanity the enemy of man. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is what these globalist technocrats literally think about day and night, and certainly we're in the 1970s when this first came around. This is an interesting example of propaganda. Maybe it, is, it deserves its own uh, feature on my Propaganda Watch series, but this is recycled propaganda. It's like second-order propaganda, because this was propaganda that was created in the 1970s for the 1970s audience. As you can see, if you watch that ABC uh, report, please do watch it. It's uh, it's just, it, it's laughable, of course, from today's standards, to see this stupid, ridiculous computer printout of this graph that shows, and population will go up, and pollution will go way up, and we'll all die. <laughs> and And it's just total, I mean, you can tell this is just total nonsense that they've just plugged some numbers into a computer, and oh look, we're all gonna die in the 2020 to 2040 range. Um, but, they're kind of recycling this propaganda and bringing it back up because now we're almost at that magical 2020 year, which clearly is not going to happen. It's not going to be this this pollution is going to kill everyone, whatever. We're running out of resources that they were predicting in the 70s. But they're bringing it back and bringing it back in front of the public's face. And I don't think, I mean, it's not necessarily to say, look, this 1973 prediction was stunningly accurate. It's just to keep that apocalyptic end of the world scenario back and fresh in the public's minds and just in a different form in a way that people might not have seen it otherwise and if you again if you go and watch that report every question that the interviewer is asking these club of rome representatives every time they bring it back to and national sovereignty will have to be eroded it will have to be destroyed this idea that st states can be sovereign and aren't dependent on the world blah 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 everything just goes back to their globalist technocratic ideology surprise surprise so it is i mean it's transparent propaganda but interesting it's kind of like nostalgia propaganda i don't even know what to call this <laughs> it, it it has been said in their line of work they have to repeat themselves to catapult the propaganda. That's a classic quote. But it's not all apocalypse now. As we wrap up this episode, James, as you mentioned just earlier, you have that latest episode, Good News This Week, from game-changing legal decisions to the turn away from zombie tech. I love that you are making good news episodes. Just please don't start making you know daily DJ sets episodes. That's You're going to really start stepping on my toes there. <laughs> my truth music video is about to drop for the summer 2018. Sorry. <laughs> The, the, the annual one's good. The, the annual Truth Music show is fantastic. I also have my latest Good News Next Week episode, Town Loses Police Force, World Still Turns. And I also, of course, in the wrap-up of these episodes, I always like to remind you, I do stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific Time, mediamonarchy.com slash listen. James? Awesome. I hope people are tuning in, and I hope they'll uh, tune into corporatereport.com as well. As uh, no, no rest for the wicked, no holidays over here, but uh, maybe things a little bit quieter during this summer doldrum. But uh, anyway, I will still be around doing videos and interviews and more, so I hope people will stay tuned. Thank you, James. Looking forward to talking to you again. All right. Thanks, buddy. Take care. listening to the Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com